Welcome to the Quick Pro Camera Guide for the Nikon D5100. This is a great camera that will capture amazing images as well as HD video. We hope you'll enjoy learning more about it in this video. This guide is meant to be a study tool to be used in connection with and not a replacement of your camera's owner's manual. You can watch it entirely in one sitting or by chapter. The functions and features of the D5100 that we cover are designed to give you a solid working knowledge of your camera. Our goal is to not only explain how to adjust the settings on your camera, but also help you understand when and why you would be motivated to take creative control of your camera. It's really not possible to cover every configuration on your camera, but we will provide you a very solid foundation to build your digital photography skills on. With this new information, you'll be able to improve your ability to capture great pictures in a variety of shooting settings. The D5100 has an impressive 16 megapixel image sensor, a fully articulated LCD screen, an 11 point autofocus system, new effects modes, and a new HDR setting, and many other great features and functions that we'll discuss in this guide. Let's get started. Your D5100 has many sophisticated buttons and dials, and to take the best pictures with your camera, you'll want to be familiar with the functions of each of them. Let's begin by taking a closer look at many of the camera's features. First, there is the power switch and the shutter release button. To take a picture, simply press and hold the shutter release button halfway down for a moment, allow the camera to focus, and press it the rest of the way down to take the picture. This is the movie record button, the exposure compensation aperture button, and the information button. This is the mode dial. It has four settings, each with different options and benefits. This section contains the camera's auto modes. In these modes, the camera will do all the work for you. All you have to do is point and shoot. These are the scene modes. Here you can choose from five different scene modes on the dial itself, and 11 more within the scene setting. These modes can help you quickly capture great pictures when you're in specific shooting scenarios. The effects mode is a new feature from Nikon. These modes allow you to create one of seven creative special effects with your images. And these are the P, S, A, and M modes, the manual modes that allow you to take the most control over exposure, depth of field, and motion blur. We'll discuss more about the various modes on the D5100 later in this guide. On this side of the camera, we'll find the SD memory card slot cover. When you're inserting a memory card, you want to make sure that the manufacturer's logo is facing the back of the camera. Simply insert the card, press it in until it clicks into place, and then close the card slot cover. Before you start taking pictures with a new memory card, it's a good idea to format it. Also keep in mind that your camera will operate faster if you periodically reformat your memory card rather than simply deleting images from it to free up space for more picture taking. Make sure that you don't reformat your card unless you have already copied the images that you want to save to your computer. Reformatting your card will erase all the images. To format the SD memory card, press the menu button and use the camera's multi-selector to navigate to the setup menu, indicated by a wrench icon. Use the multi-selector to scroll down to the format memory card option and press OK. Select Yes and press OK. Also on this side of the camera, you'll find the connector cover, which will allow you to connect the camera to other devices. Here you'll find the accessory terminal, the USB and AV terminal, which will allow you to connect the camera to the computer, a compatible printer, or a TV. This terminal will allow you to connect the camera to an HD television. And this is the connector for an external microphone for movie recording. Just above the camera's built-in flash, you'll see the hot shoe. The hot shoe is where optional external flash units and other accessories can be attached to the camera. An optional flash unit can significantly improve the quality of light in your images. One of the biggest benefits of owning a digital SLR camera is the ability to use a variety of lenses. To mount or install a lens, make sure that the camera is switched to off, hold the camera with one hand and the lens with the other like this, and align the lens's index with the camera's index. Then gently rotate the lens until it clicks into place. Take great care not to scratch the lens by allowing it to make contact with anything. When you need to clean your lens, it's a good idea to use a lens cloth. 
Other fabrics can dull or scratch your lens. When you want to dismount a lens, press the lens release button while holding the camera with the same hand, and then with the other hand, rotate the lens until it uncouples. Avoid changing lenses in windy or dusty conditions. This will help the image sensor stay clean and free of dust. Now let's take a look at the back of the camera. The most prominent feature is the fully articulated 3-inch LCD screen. When rotating or tilting the LCD monitor, note that it will pivot, tilt, and rotate in specific directions, and forcing the monitor in a direction other than is intended may cause damage. This screen serves several purposes. First, it displays images that have been taken. Using the camera's multi-selector, you can scroll through the images on the memory card. Second, when the mode dial is rotated or the shutter button is pressed, the LCD monitor provides fast and easy access to the camera's shooting settings in the information display. Third, when the menu button is pressed, the LCD monitor displays the camera's menu settings, where you can change many important settings on the camera. Directly above the LCD monitor is the viewfinder, where you can see the camera's settings before taking a picture. Before you start taking pictures, you'll want to focus the viewfinder. To do this, use the diopter adjustment control located to the right of the eye cup. Rotate the control until the automatic focus points in the viewfinder are in sharp focus. At the bottom of the viewfinder display, you can see the focus indicator, the shutter speed, aperture, exposure meter in the P, S, A, and M modes, the number of shots remaining, and when the flash is being used, the flash ready indicator. Over the scene, you will see the camera's focus points. When the shutter is pressed halfway to focus, the areas where the focus points blink in red will be in focus. This is the information edit button. When the information display is shown on the LCD monitor, pressing this button will allow you to quickly change many of the camera's shooting settings. This is the shooting mode, the aperture shutter speed display, the shutter speed, the aperture, and the exposure flash compensation indicator. This is the beep indicator and the battery indicator. On the right side of the information display, you can see all of the settings that you can quickly access and adjust. First, there is the image quality setting, the image size, the white balance, the ISO sensitivity, the release mode, the focus mode, the AF area mode, the metering mode, and the active delighting setting. With active delighting enabled, much more detail will be preserved in the shadow and highlight areas of an image. Note that at higher ISO settings, active delighting can increase the amount of digital noise in the image. The last option on this side of the screen is the bracketing increment. At the bottom of the screen, you'll see the camera's autofocus indicators and the focus point indicator. Here is the flash mode setting, the flash compensation setting, the exposure compensation setting, and the picture control. The D5100 has six different picture control options. This is the help icon. Pressing the help button will allow you to view information about the currently displayed screen. Finally, at the bottom right corner, you will see the number of shots remaining, or how many more photos that you can take with the SD memory card. This is the AEL-AFL protect button. The AEL is for auto exposure lock. When you're using the center weighted or spot metering modes, pressing and holding this button will lock the exposure while you recompose the image. The AFL button is for auto focus lock. Pressing and holding this button will lock the focus while you recompose the image. The final purpose of this button is to protect images from accidental deletion. We'll talk more about the protect function later in this guide. Here is the command dial. Rotating this dial allows you to change exposure settings as well as many other camera settings. This is the playback button. Pressing this button will allow you to view your images on the LCD monitor. As we've discussed, this is the multi-selector. This is used for navigating the menu system, scrolling through images in playback, and accessing information on the information display. In the center of the multi-selector is the OK button. Press this button to confirm your selections in the information display and menu systems. These are the playback zoom in and playback zoom out buttons. The playback zoom out button also functions as the help button. You can use the delete button to delete images from the camera's SD card.
Your Nikon D5100 can record image files in two different file types, RAW and JPEG. Both file types have benefits and drawbacks to consider. Let's talk a little bit about these two image file types. There are several important things to know about RAW files. First, they are not actually image files. They are actually the raw data saved to the memory card directly from the image sensor. Next, RAW files are uncompressed, meaning that the file sizes are considerably larger than those of compressed files. RAW files have a much broader range of tones. Shadow and highlight areas have more detail than JPEG files. Also, you can make extensive edits to a RAW file without losing data or image quality. And finally, RAW files appear flatter with less color and contrast and must be processed on the computer before they're printed. JPEG files, however, are very different from RAW files. JPEG files are a standard image file format that can be read by any image software. They are compressed, which means that not all of the image data is actually saved. Because they are compressed, JPEGs are much smaller in file size. JPEGs have a more narrow range of shadows and highlights and will lose some image data each time that they're edited. Finally, JPEG files are processed by your camera and are able to be printed directly from the memory card. Because JPEG images require less time when editing on the computer, I use a high quality JPEG setting for everyday picture taking and snapshots. If I know ahead of time that I'm going to be extensively editing my images, I will choose the RAW plus JPEG format. Let's take a look now at how to choose the image quality and the file settings on the D5100. With the information display active on the LCD, we'll press the information edit button and use the multi selector to navigate to the image quality and size options. We'll press OK to see the options and make changes. The top option is the image quality and the one below it is the image size. It's important to set both of these options. Let's first talk about the seven different image quality settings. There are four RAW options, including RAW plus Fine JPEG, meaning that each time a photo is taken, two files will be saved, one RAW and one Fine Quality JPEG. You can also choose RAW plus Normal JPEG or RAW plus Basic JPEG. The final RAW option will simply save the RAW file with no JPEG. The JPEG options include Fine, Normal, and Basic. The JPEG image quality options determine how much compression is used when the JPEG file is saved to the memory card. Images with a fine setting will have the least compression. Images with a normal setting will have moderate compression. And images with a basic setting will have the most compression. Now let's take a look at the image size options. This is where you choose how many megapixels you'd like the camera to use when recording images. The first image size option is large. Choosing this setting will use all 16 megapixels. The medium option uses about 9 megapixels, and the small option uses about 4 megapixels. You might choose the medium or small size options if you're only using these photos for emailing or posting online, but most of the time you'll probably want to use the large option. Now that we've discussed image quality and file types, let's talk a little bit about how to archive and back up these files for future use and safekeeping. It's important to always have your files saved in at least two different locations. There are many ways you can back up your files, and we'll discuss a few of them here, including CDs and DVDs, external and redundant hard drive systems, and online backup services. Regardless of which methods of backup you choose, you'll want to have a regular system for backing up your files. It's a good idea to create backups at the same time as you download the files from the camera's memory card for post-processing. Remember to create backups in two different locations in addition to your regular working hard drive. You'll also want to create backups of your processed images at set times each day, week, or month, depending on how frequently you're updating or adding to the files on your computer. The most affordable way to create a backup of your files is to burn them to CDs or DVDs. It's always a good idea to make multiple copies of each CD or DVD as well as have at least one additional backup method. There are a few things to know about using CDs or DVDs to archive your images. Although the topic is debatable, our research found that many low quality writable CDs or DVDs have an average lifespan of about 15 years when properly stored and cared for. 
If you choose to use these discs, you'll want to make sure that you not only have multiple backups of each disc, but you'll also want to periodically check the discs for signs of deterioration or discoloration. There are several companies that use gold and silver in the manufacture of their discs to ensure the archival quality. These discs are more costly than their lower quality counterparts, but they will normally have a lifespan of anywhere from 100 to 300 years. Be sure to look for the manufacturer's guarantee when shopping for silver or gold CDs or DVDs. Although these discs are more archival, you will still want to make sure that you have multiple copies of each disc. Regardless of which type of CD or DVD you use to back up your image files, you'll want to follow a few simple rules to help your discs last as long as possible. First, always check the disc to verify that the contents have been successfully recorded before placing it in storage. Always handle the discs with care using only the outer edges or the center hole. Also, only use non-solvent permanent marker on the disc and only write on the inner hub area. Finally, you also want to make sure that the discs are stored upright in jewel cases or paper sleeves in a cool, dry place. In addition to having a CD or DVD backup of your files, it's also a good idea to have the files saved using another method. External hard drives have become increasingly affordable and are available in a variety of capacities. When you use an external hard drive for backup purposes, you'll want to use a different hard drive for everyday working use to preserve the integrity of the backup drive. Another option for backing up your image files is a redundant hard drive or RAID system. These systems vary in size, speed, and cost, but can be an effective backup method. Let's discuss how these systems work. Inside this box, there are four hard drives. Some systems have two hard drives, others have four or more. Each of the hard drives can hold the exact same data. This way, when one of the drives fails, the other drive will still have all the data, and the bad drive can easily be replaced and repopulated with the data from the good drive. The system is connected to a computer using a standard USB cable or through a network. Some of these systems are very user-friendly and easy to install. Others may require the assistance of your local computer service technician. Again, it's a good idea to have your files saved using at least one additional method. One other way to keep a backup of your files is through an online backup service. These services vary not only in cost, but in the way that the backups are managed. Most of these services will require that you install a piece of software on your computer. At a set time, each day, week, or month, the software will back up your files via the internet to a remote server. One of the advantages of using an online backup service is that in case of fire or other natural disaster, your files will be safe at an off-site location. Many photographers keep external hard drives, CDs, or DVDs in addition to using an online backup service. One of the most important concepts in photography is exposure, or the amount of light that falls on the camera's image sensor or film. A properly exposed photo will have good detail in the shadow, mid-tone, and highlight areas. Photos that are too bright are overexposed, and photos that are too dark are said to be underexposed. There are three ways that your D5100 measures light. These are the camera's metering modes. The camera's metering modes can be changed in the P, S, A, and M modes only. To access the camera's metering modes, we'll press the Information Edit button to enter the information display and navigate to the metering mode icon. The first metering mode is called Matrix Metering. This is an all-around metering mode suited for general picture taking. The camera sets the exposure automatically to suit the scene. This is a good mode to use for many situations, but sometimes when the scene is very bright or very dark, you'll want to use a different metering mode. The next mode is center weighted metering. This is a classic metering mode used for portraits. Center weighted metering will evaluate the entire frame and assign the greatest weight to the center area. The last metering mode is spot metering. This is a great mode to use when there's a lot of contrast between the background and the subject, when the background is either very bright or very dark. This metering mode will meter off the selected focus point, unless the focus point selection is set to auto, in which case metering will be determined based on the center focus point. 
Now that you know a little bit about how your camera sees and measures light to create properly exposed photos, let's talk a little bit about shooting modes on the D5100. Your camera features a variety of shooting modes ranging from fully automatic to completely manual. This gives you a lot of flexibility and creative control over your photos. You can adjust the exposure, shutter speed, and depth of field settings on your camera to help capture the pictures that you want. As you become more familiar with these concepts and principles, you'll improve your ability to capture the best pictures possible. This section of the mode dial contains the auto modes for your camera. These modes are auto and flash off. When shooting in these modes, all you'll have to do is point and shoot. The camera will do all the work for you. The D5100 has six different options for scene modes on the mode dial. Let's discuss a little bit about each of them. First, there is the scene option. When this mode is selected, you will have the ability to quickly choose the scene mode you'd like by rotating the command dial. The options are shown on the information display and include night portrait, night landscape, party indoor, beach snow, sunset, dusk dawn, pet portrait, candlelight, blossom, autumn colors, and food. The next scene mode option on the mode dial is the portrait mode. To shoot in this mode, rotate the mode dial to select it. Use this mode when you want the subject to be in focus and what is behind the subject to have a soft focus. In portrait mode, the aperture is set wide open. The aperture is controlled inside of the lens. An open aperture indicates that the lens will let all the light it can into the shutter. With a wide aperture, you'll get a short depth of field. The next mode is the landscape mode. In this mode, the aperture will have a very narrow opening, creating a very long depth of field. The camera will then adjust the shutter speed to get the proper exposure. This mode will give you a sharp focus in both the foreground and the background. In this setting, the shutter speed can get pretty slow, so be sure to steady your camera or use a tripod to avoid camera shake. The next mode is the child mode. This shooting mode is great for snapshots of children. The camera will capture bright and vivid colors, but keep skin tones natural. To capture fast moving subjects, select the sports mode. When shooting in sports mode, the camera selects a fast shutter speed to help freeze the action. A telephoto lens is a good investment if you want to shoot great action pictures. A telephoto or long lens helps you get closer to the action and gives you a greater range of focal length options. The last shooting mode is the close-up mode. This shooting mode is used to capture flowers or other small objects that are physically close to the camera lens. This mode tells the camera to use a large aperture opening to provide a shallow depth of field. Use this at the lens's minimum focusing distance. The D5100 also features a unique effects mode where you can take photos with special effects. To use the special effects, rotate the mode dial to effects. The seven different options are shown on the information display and can be selected simply by rotating the command dial. Let's briefly discuss each of these modes. First, there is the selective color mode. With this mode, you can select only one color to be visible in the image, and the other colors will be black and white. To use this mode, make sure that the mode dial is set to effects and rotate the command dial until selective color is shown on the information display. Now you'll want to choose the color you want to show up in the image using the camera's live view. Enter live view by rotating the live view switch. Place the colored object within the small white frame and press the up arrow on the multi-selector to choose that color. Now, using the up-down arrows on the multi-selector, you can adjust the range of hues that you'd like the camera to include. When you're finished making adjustments, press OK. Now take the picture. Only the color that you've selected will be shown in the image, and everything else will be black and white. The next effect mode is Silhouette. This is a great mode to use outdoors at sunset when you'd like to capture a silhouette of your subject. With the information display shown on the LCD, rotate the command dial until silhouette is selected. Now simply compose your shot and take the picture. The next effects mode is high key. You can use this mode when you're taking pictures of a scene that is very bright. 
The high key mode makes images appear to be filled with light. Similar to the high key mode, the next effects mode is low key. This is a good mode to use to capture dark images and retain prominent highlights. The next effect mode is night vision. This mode is useful when you want to take photos in the dark with very high ISOs. Select this mode by rotating the main dial. To autofocus, the camera must be set to live view. Images taken in this mode are black and white and have digital noise. You may want to use a tripod to reduce image blur. The next effects mode is color sketch effects mode. With this mode, you can take creative photos with only the color outlines of the object in the image visible. Again, simply rotate the command dial to select this mode. The final effects mode is the miniature effect. Using this mode, you can make distant subjects appear to be very small. To take a photo with a miniature effect, you'll need to be using Live View. Here, you can use the multi-selector to choose a focus point. Next, press OK to view the options for the miniature effect. You can choose to have the in-focus area of the image be wide or narrow, and you can choose to have it be horizontal or vertical in the frame. Press OK when you're finished making your selections. Now simply take the picture. Now that we've talked about the more basic shooting modes, let's discuss the camera's P, S, A, and M modes. Note that we'll learn about these modes, but we won't spend very much time discussing basic photography concepts. If you'd like to learn more about how to use the camera's P, S, A, and M modes to take amazing photos, you may benefit from Quick Pro's Fundamentals series, which covers important elements of photography, including exposure, basic lighting, and composition. This section of the mode dial has the P, S, A, and M modes. These modes include P, or Programmed Auto, S, or Shutter Priority, A, or Aperture Priority, and M, or Manual. The first mode is called Programmed Auto and is represented with a P on the mode dial. In this mode, the camera automatically adjusts shutter speed and aperture for optimal exposure. This may seem similar to the auto modes in the basic zones, but with the P mode, you have control over the camera's aperture, shutter speed, focus mode, drive mode, and built-in flash settings. To operate in this mode, rotate the mode dial to P. Press the shutter button halfway down to activate the viewfinder. To monitor the aperture and exposure settings, look through the viewfinder, hold the shutter halfway down to focus, then press the shutter all the way to take the picture. You may find that the shutter speed is too slow for what you're photographing, or that the aperture does not give you a depth of field that you're looking for. If you'd like to change the camera's shutter speed and aperture combination, simply rotate the command dial. Rotate the command dial to the right for large apertures and fast shutter speeds, and rotate the command dial to the left for small apertures and slow shutter speeds. The next setting on the mode dial is the S, or Shutter Priority Mode. The Shutter Priority Mode is useful for times when you want to control motion in a scene, whether it's freezing action or blurring the motion of the subject. In this mode, you'll set the shutter speed and the camera will automatically select an appropriate aperture value for proper exposure. To use the camera in shutter priority mode, set the mode dial to S, hold the shutter button halfway down to allow the camera to focus, and rotate the command dial to set the shutter speed. The Nikon D5100 has shutter speeds that range from very slow, 30 full seconds, to very fast, 1 4,000th of a second. You can view the shutter speed and aperture values through the camera's viewfinder or on the information display. The next setting on the mode dial is the A, or Aperture Priority Mode. The Aperture Priority Mode is useful for times when you want to control depth of field in an image. Depth of field is the term used to describe the distance between the nearest and farthest objects in a scene that appear acceptably sharp in an image. When only a small area or subject in an image is in focus, it is said to have a shallow depth of field. This effect is achieved by using a smaller f-stop number. When everything in both the foreground and background is in focus, an image is said to have a long depth of field. For a long depth of field, choose a large f-stop number. When you're shooting in aperture priority mode, you'll set the aperture and the camera will automatically select the correct shutter speed for proper exposure. Select this mode when you want to create a long or short depth of field. To use this mode, set the mode dial to A and press the shutter button halfway down to focus. 
Rotate the command dial to select an aperture value as you watch the display through the viewfinder. Once you've made your selection, press the shutter button to take the picture. The next advanced shooting mode is manual or M mode. This mode gives you complete control of the camera. In manual mode, you will set the shutter speed and aperture to create the exposure. To operate the camera in manual mode, rotate the mode dial to M. To set the shutter speed, rotate the command dial. To set the aperture, press and hold the aperture button while rotating the command dial. Press the shutter button halfway so that as you're making adjustments to the aperture and shutter speed, you can watch the exposure scale either on the LCD monitor or through the viewfinder. When the exposure level indicator is near the center of the scale, the image will be properly exposed. You can choose just the right aperture and shutter speed combination for your scene, whether you want to freeze action or create a very shallow depth of field. Make the necessary adjustments to the aperture and shutter speed so that the exposure level indicator is near the center of the scale. Then press the shutter button halfway down to focus and the rest of the way down to take the picture. In addition to aperture and shutter speed, the camera's ISO settings will have a significant impact on whether your images are properly exposed. The ISO setting affects the imaging sensor's sensitivity to light. The higher the number, the less light that is required to properly expose the image sensor. You can either have the camera automatically choose the sensitivity or you can set it manually. Here's how to set the ISO on the D5100. Press the Information Edit button to enter the information display. Use the multi-selector to navigate to the ISO setting and press OK to select it. Here you can use the multi-selector to choose the ISO setting. Once you've made your selection, press OK to select it. It's a good idea to set the ISO speed to suit the ambient light setting that you're shooting in. When you increase the ISO speed, a higher number, for low light, a fast shutter speed can be used to avoid blurry images. Keep in mind that a higher ISO setting may introduce noise or grain into your images. An ISO setting that is too high for the shooting conditions will make the image lose quality and you might even start to see particles in your pictures. Experiment with ISO settings to become more familiar with their range and control. The image sensor on your camera is very powerful. It gives you the flexibility to shoot in low light conditions and still get amazing pictures. Here is a guide that will help you have a basic idea of what ISO settings to use in various situations. When you're outdoors in full sun, use ISO 100 to 200. In the shade on an overcast day or indoors with lots of window light, use ISO 400. ISOs 800 and higher should be used indoors for action shots or in other low light conditions. There are six different ways that your camera can take pictures when the shutter button is pressed. These are called the release modes. Release modes determine how many times the shutter releases when you press the shutter button. The D5100 has single frame, continuous, self timer, delayed remote, quick response remote, and quiet release modes. With these release modes, you can take pictures continuously, single shots, or use the self timer or a remote. The release modes are set automatically in the automatic and scene modes. You have full control of the release modes in the other shooting modes. To access the release modes, press the information edit button and enter the information display. Navigate to the release mode setting and press OK. Here you can choose the release mode using the multi selector and the OK button. In single shooting mode, one picture will be taken when you press the shutter button completely. This is a good mode for stationary subjects. The continuous release mode will record up to four frames per second when the shutter button is pressed down completely. The self timer mode takes the picture 10 seconds after the shutter button is pressed completely. Use this mode for self portraits or with a tripod to reduce camera shake at very low shutter speeds. The next two release modes are for use with an optional remote control. The delayed remote release mode will take the picture two seconds after the remote shutter button is pressed. The quick response remote release will take the picture at the exact time the remote shutter button is pressed. The final release mode, the quiet shutter release, is like the single frame release mode except that it does not beep when focus is achieved. This mode keeps sound to a minimum in quiet surroundings.
The Nikon D5100 has two features in addition to the camera shooting modes that you can use to capture great photos and amazing HD video. Let's discuss the camera's live view and movie modes. To shoot in live view or prepare for movie recording, rotate the live view switch to LV. The view will be displayed on the camera's LCD. Please note that it is important to avoid directing camera's lens toward the sun in live view and movie modes as this can seriously damage the camera's internal components. Next, you'll need to choose the camera's AF mode as well as the AF area mode. To choose the AF mode, press the Information Edit button to place the cursor in the information display. Then navigate to the Focus Mode options. In Live View, you can choose from AFS or Single Servo AF, AFF or Full Time Servo AF, and Manual Focus. The AFS or Single Servo AF Focus Mode is best suited for stationary subjects. The focus will be locked using the selected focus point when the shutter is pressed halfway. Use this mode when you're photographing objects or stationary people. The other autofocus mode that is available in live view and movie mode is AFF or full time servo. This is a great mode to use for moving subjects. Using the selected focus point, the camera will focus continually even without the shutter button being pressed. Focus will be locked when the shutter button is pressed halfway down. After you've selected the autofocus mode, you'll need to choose the autofocus area mode. To do this, press the information edit button to place the cursor in the display. Then navigate to the AF area options. In live view and movie modes, there are four different AF area modes. Face priority, wide area, normal area, and subject tracking. The AF area modes determine how the camera chooses the focus point or area. For the wide, normal, and subject tracking AF area modes, use the multi-selector to move the focus point to the desired area of the frame. You can press the OK button to quickly place the focus point in the center of the frame. If you select face priority, the camera will automatically find and focus on faces in the frame. Wide area is best suited for photographing landscapes or other non-portrait subjects. Use normal area when you want to pinpoint focus on a specific part of the frame. Using a tripod will help you make sure that focus stays exactly where you want it. This is a great mode to use when you're photographing small subjects. The last AF area mode is subject tracking. This mode is great for moving subjects. You'll need to position the focus point and press the OK button. This will tell the camera to track the subject in the focus point as it moves across the frame. To end subject tracking, press the OK button again. In the default live view screen, several important shooting settings are displayed on the screen. Here you'll see the metering mode, the shutter speed, aperture, and ISO. This is the number of shots remaining. Here is the battery indicator. The battery will be depleted more rapidly in live view, so you'll want to keep an eye on the battery indicator. This icon is the beep indicator. At the top of the screen, you'll see the shooting mode, the audio recording indicator, the flash mode, the release mode, the AF mode and AF area mode, the active delighting setting, the picture control, the white balance setting, and the image size and quality. Here you can see how much time is available for movie recording on the SD card, and this icon indicates the movie frame size. To hide many of these icons, press the Info button. To view a framing grid, press the Info button again. Pressing the Info button a third time will take you back to the default Live View screen. In addition to Live View, your D5100 is also capable of shooting high quality HD video. When shooting movies, use an SD Speed Class 6 memory card or higher. If a slower memory card is used, the movie may not be properly recorded. While shooting movies or in live view, be sure that you do not point the lens directly into the sun as it may damage the camera's components. Just like capturing still photos, you can set the camera to record video in different resolutions or frame sizes. Each frame size has a high or normal quality setting and 24 or 30 frames per second options. Choosing 24 frames per second will closely imitate the look that you would get 
if you're using a film video camera. 30 frames per second is more like what you see on television. The purpose or use of the finished video will help you decide which frame size and quality setting to use. Keep in mind that the higher the resolution, the larger the file sizes will be. The movie recording options, including frame size and quality, are available in the camera shooting menu under Movie Settings. The first option, Movie Quality, is where you'll be able to select the frame size and quality. Choosing one of the top four options, 1920 by 1080, will allow you to capture full HD video. Use this when you want the highest resolution video that the camera is capable of recording. Choosing the high quality over the normal quality setting will not affect the resolution of your video, but it will allow you to capture smoother motion in action sequences. The second resolution option is 1280 by 720. It's a good option when you want to have high quality video, but it doesn't need to be full HD. This frame size could be used for family home movies or similar scenarios. The final frame size option is 640 by 424. This option is great for videos that you only intend to post on the internet. The lower resolution makes the file size smaller, making it easier to post the video for sharing online. Recording movies with your D5100 is easy. To use the camera's movie mode, make sure that the camera is in live view by rotating the live view switch. Before recording, focus using the methods we've discussed. Press the movie recording button to start recording and press it again to stop recording. Your movie files will be saved as MOV files. To view a movie that you have recorded, press the playback button and scroll to the movie that you would like to play. Press the OK button to enter the movie playback. To trim a movie, enter the movie playback. At the point that you'd like to have your clip start or end, press the down button on the multi-selector. Then press the AEL-AFL button to select the start or end point of your movie clip and use the multi-selector to make your selection. Press OK. The last thing that you'll need to do is delete the extra frames. To do this, simply press the up arrow on the multi-selector and choose Yes when prompted. If you find that the recorded movies are too bright or too dark, you can make adjustments to the exposure compensation. To do this, simply press and hold the exposure compensation button. To make the image brighter, rotate the command dial to the left. Note that the plus sign of the exposure compensation icon is visible. To make the image darker, rotate the command dial to the right. Note that the minus sign of the exposure compensation icon is visible when images are made darker. To record sound in movie mode, the D5100 has a built-in microphone, which will record sound automatically by default. If you'd like to change the microphone sensitivity or turn off sound recording, you can do this through the camera's menu system. In the shooting menu, scroll to the movie settings and select Microphone. Here you can choose Auto Sensitivity, High Sensitivity, Medium Sensitivity, Low Sensitivity, or Microphone Off. The Nikon D5100 has a large LCD monitor where you can review images, adjust menu settings, and access the information display. There are many options available for previewing images and many of the camera's settings can easily be accessed through the information display. Let's discuss how to use these camera features. For basic playback of your images on the camera's LCD monitor, simply press the playback button. You can then use the multi-selector to scroll through the images. If you have a large number of images recorded on the SD memory card, you may find that it's faster to find the photos that you'd like to view if you display multiple photos on the screen at once. To do this, simply press the Zoom Out button. Pressing the Zoom Out button once will display four images on the LCD monitor. Pressing the Zoom Out button again will display nine images, and pressing the Zoom Out button a third time will display 72 images. From here, you can use the multi-selector to scroll through the images and press the OK button for a full screen display of the image that you'd like to view. You can also magnify images on the LCD monitor. This is especially useful when you want to check for good focus in detail areas of the photo. Press the zoom in button once or multiple times to see the desired level of detail in the photo. Then you can use the multi-selector to scroll top to bottom and side to side of the photo. 
As you're scrolling through photos in the camera's playback, you may find some images that you'd like to protect from accidentally being erased. To protect an image, simply press the Protect button. A small key icon will appear on the LCD to indicate that the image is protected. Simply press the Protect button again to unprotect the image. If you find a photo that didn't turn out, you can delete it from your memory card by pressing the Delete button. When the Erase dialog appears, press the Delete button again and the image will be removed from the memory card. Note that once an image is erased, it cannot be recovered. There are six different playback screens on the D5100. By default, only one of the screens is enabled. To enable the other screen options, press the Menu button and navigate to the Playback menu. Select Playback Display Options. Here you can use the Multi Selector and the OK button to select each of the options to be enabled. When you're finished, scroll back to Done and press OK. Let's take a look at the first and default playback screen. This screen shows some important information about the image. First, there is the folder name where the image is saved, the file name, image quality and size settings, and the date and time that the image was recorded. At the top right corner of the screen, the frame number out of the total number of images is displayed. To view additional playback displays, press the up or down arrow button on the multi-selector. Pressing the up arrow button will display a full frame image with no additional information. Pressing the up arrow again will display the overview playback display. In addition to the information that was shown in the default or file information playback display, there is a histogram of the image. The histogram gives a basic idea of the tone distribution of an image. If the histogram is shifted to the left side of the graph, the image will probably be dark or underexposed. If the histogram is shifted to the right side of the graph, the image will be too bright or overexposed. In most cases, a properly exposed photo will have data distributed over the whole graph. The histogram will help you have a basic idea of the overall exposure of your image when you're outdoors in bright sunlight and the photos are difficult to see on the LCD monitor. This screen also shows the metering mode, the shooting mode, the shutter speed, the aperture, the ISO setting, the focal length, the flash and exposure compensation settings, the white balance setting, the color space, the picture control, and the active delighting setting. Pressing the up arrow again will display the first screen of the shooting data display. There are three screens in this display. Press the up arrow on the multi-selector to view the additional screens. The next playback display is the RGB histogram display. This screen shows a histogram for each of the red, green, and blue channels of the image. Here you can see the areas in any of the individual channels that are shifted to the left, showing the dark tones in that channel, or shifted to the right, showing the lighter tones in that color channel. If any of the channels has distribution that is shifted too far to the right, that color channel will be oversaturated and show little or no detail. The last screen available in the playback display is blinking highlights. This feature is useful for times when you may want to have the camera warn you if certain areas of your photo are overexposed. In this playback display, areas that are very overexposed and have lost detail and highlights will blink in black. In the playback mode, there are several useful and creative ways that you can process your images in camera. These are the retouch menu options and are accessible in playback mode by pressing the OK button. Let's discuss several of these options now. The first item in this menu is delighting, which allows you to brighten shadow areas in an image. First, you'll need to select the image you want to apply the correction to and choose the amount of correction you'd like to apply. On the right side of the screen, a preview image is displayed as you scroll through the options. Choosing low will improve some of the darkest shadow areas. Normal will brighten more of the shadow areas and high will brighten most of the shadow areas in the image. After you've made your selection, press OK to save the image. The camera will make a copy of the image and save it to the memory card. Retouched images have the retouch icon displayed at the top of the image. Another useful feature is trim, where you can crop a photo in camera. Using the camera's zoom in and zoom out buttons, you can adjust the size of the crop 
and rotating the command dial will allow you to change the aspect ratio. You can also use the multi-selector to move the crop to your desired area of the frame. Finally, you can press OK to apply the crop and save the image as a separate file. Although photo editing software makes it fast and easy to convert your color images to black and white, your camera will do a great job with this task as well with the monochrome menu option. You can choose from black and white, sepia, or brown tone, or cyanotype, or blue tone. With both sepia and cyanotype, you can adjust the intensity of the color with the multi-selectors up and down arrows. In the filter effects section of the retouch menu, you can choose to apply one of seven filters to your image. The skylight filter will reduce the blue in the image. The warm filter will give the photo a warm red cast. The red, green, and blue intensifiers will enhance the intensity of that specific color in the image. You can use the multi-selectors up and down arrow keys to increase or decrease the effect. The cross screen filter is a way to create starburst effects for the light sources in the image. There are several options with this filter. First, you can choose the number of points that you'd like each starburst to have, four, six, or eight. Then you'll choose the amount or the brightness of the light sources that will be affected. You'll also need to choose the angle and length of the filter points. After your selections have been made, you can select confirm to see the effects of your changes. From here, you can make adjustments or you can save to have your copy saved to the memory card. The last filter in the filter effects is the soft filter, which will apply a soft photo effect to the image. You can use the multi-selector to choose the amount of softness that is applied and press OK to save a copy of the image. Also in the retouch menu is the image overlay option. With this feature, you can mimic the effect of a double exposure image with better results than can be produced with photo editing software. Note that when using image overlay, only raw image files can be used. The D5100's NEF or raw processing will make a JPEG copy of a raw file and save it to the memory card. To use the camera's NEF or raw processing, highlight the option in the retouch menu, select the image that you'd like to save a copy of. Here you can adjust several items, image quality and size, white balance, exposure compensation, picture control, ISO noise reduction, color space, and delighting. After you have made the desired adjustments to each of these settings, highlight EXE and press OK to make a JPEG copy of the image. Another useful function in the retouch menu is the resize option, where you can create smaller copies of images. First, you'll want to choose the size of the image copy. Options ranging between 2.5 megabytes and 0.1 megabytes are available. Press OK to create a resized copy. The straighten function can be used for any image, but it is especially helpful for landscapes and photos of architecture. Using this function is simple. Select Straighten in the Retouch menu and choose the images you'd like to straighten. Using the left or right arrow buttons on the multi-selector, align the horizon or any other reference line with the displayed grid. When you've adjusted the photo to your liking, press the OK button to have the camera save a copy of the image. Depending on the lens and the focal length that you use, you may find that some of your images have some distortion a sometimes unwanted effect where the photo appears to be either bloated or pinched. The D5100 has a feature to help correct distortion. To use it, select Distortion Control in the Retouch menu. Choose Auto to have the camera automatically correct distortion, and you'll only need to fine-tune it with the multi-selector. If you'd like to have complete control over distortion control, select Manual. Next, select the image you'd like to work with and press OK. Use the multi-selector to adjust the distortion to your liking and press OK to have the camera save a copy of the image. If you don't own a fisheye lens but you like that effect, you can recreate it with the fisheye feature in the retouch menu. Simply select fisheye and choose the image that you'd like to apply the effect to. Use the left and right arrows on the multi-selector to choose how much fisheye distortion you'd like to apply and press OK to save a copy of the image. 
similar to distortion control, the perspective control feature will help you reduce the distortion that is often caused when photos of architecture are taken from a low viewpoint. After you've chosen a photo, you can use the up, down, left and right arrows on the multi-selector to make adjustments to the perspective distortion. Again, simply press OK to save a copy of the adjusted image. One of the important principles for taking a great picture is image sharpness. Image sharpness is affected by several things, including lens focus, camera shake, depth of field, and digital noise. Let's first discuss the focus modes that are available on the D5100. When you're choosing the focus mode, the main thing you'll want to think about is whether or not the subject is in motion. The D5100 has a sophisticated autofocus system with a variety of autofocus modes and areas that when used well together will help you get great focus regardless of what type of subject you're photographing. Understanding how all of the modes and areas work together might seem a little confusing, but this chapter of this guide will help you know when to use each autofocus mode as well as each autofocus area mode. Let's first discuss the camera's three autofocus modes, Auto Servo AF, Single Servo AF, and Continuous Servo AF. To choose an autofocus mode on the D5100, make sure that the information display is shown on the LCD panel by pressing the Information button. Then press the Info Edit button to place the cursor in the display and use the multi-selector to navigate to the AF mode options. The main thing to think about when you're deciding which autofocus mode to use is whether or not your subject is in motion. In AFA or Auto Servo AF, the camera will automatically decide whether to use the Single Servo AF or the Continuous Servo AF, depending on whether or not the subject is in motion. In this mode, the camera will switch between Single and Continuous Servo automatically. AFS, or Single Servo AF, is intended for use with stationary subjects. In this mode, the focus is locked when the shutter is pressed halfway. This would be a good mode to choose if you're photographing products or doing portrait work of an older child or adult. The last autofocus mode is AFC, or Continuous Servo Autofocus. In this mode, the camera will focus continually while the shutter button is pressed halfway. This mode is great for use with moving subjects and would be a good choice if you're photographing sporting events, small children, or animals. Before we begin discussing the autofocus area modes, please note that autofocus modes and autofocus area modes are different settings, but function together. Understanding how they work together will help your images have great focus. There are four basic autofocus area modes, single point AF, dynamic area AF, 3D tracking, and auto area AF. To choose the AF area mode, press the information edit button to place the cursor in the information display and use the multi selector to navigate to the AF area mode options. The first autofocus area point is single point AF. In this autofocus area mode, you will manually select the exact focus point that you'd like the camera to use for focus. This autofocus area mode is great for stationary subjects. Once you've selected single point AF for the autofocus area mode, it's easy to select the focus point using the camera's multi-selector. You can see the focus point that is selected in both the viewfinder and the LCD monitor. The camera will focus only on the subject that is in the selected focus point. If you want to quickly set the focus point back on the center point, simply press the OK button. The next autofocus area mode is Dynamic Area AF. This mode is available only in the Auto Servo AF and Continuous Servo AF modes. When you're using this mode, the initial focus point is selected manually, just like in Single Point AF mode. In Dynamic mode, the areas or focus points surrounding the one that you select will be used as backup. This means that if the subject briefly leaves the selected point, the camera will focus based on information from the surrounding focus points. The dynamic area AF mode is great for subjects that generally move in one direction within the frame. With 3D tracking, focus can be maintained for subjects that quickly move not only side to side, but also forward and backward within the frame. Good examples of these types of subjects would be figure skaters or rodeo participants. 
In Auto Area AF, the camera will automatically find the subject and choose the appropriate focus point or points to use. This autofocus area mode is available for use with all three autofocus modes. Auto Area AF is great for snapshots or for situations when you don't have time to select the focus point manually. In the Auto Area AF mode, the camera may occasionally choose to focus on a subject other than what you had intended. Now that we've discussed the camera's autofocus modes and autofocus area modes separately, let's talk about how all of the autofocus functions could work together in a specific shooting scenario. Let's first use a sporting event, a football game as an example. Subjects in this type of scenario will be in motion, so selecting either Auto Servo or Continuous Servo AF would be a good choice. If Single Servo AF was chosen, the camera would not continue to focus on the subject as the shutter button was pressed halfway down. After the autofocus mode is set to AFA or AFC, either Dynamic Area or 3D Tracking would be good choices for the autofocus area mode. The speed and predictability of the subjects would determine whether dynamic area or 3D tracking would be the best choice. If the action is somewhat predictable and the motion is generally from side to side, using the dynamic area AF would get good results. If the action is more erratic and the motion is not only side to side but forward and backward as well, 3D tracking would be a good option. So when you're at a sporting event like a football game, you'll probably want to choose Continuous Servo AF for your focus mode. And depending on the level of action in the game, either Dynamic Area or 3D Tracking for the AF Area Mode. Now let's discuss a portrait scenario. Assuming that you're photographing an older child or adult, the subject will be stationary. So a good AF mode would be Single Servo AF. If the subject was a young child, that might move, you could also use the Auto Servo AF. For the Autofocus Area Mode, you could choose the Auto Area AF or the Single Point AF. For older subjects with less motion, the Single Point AF would be the best way to assure that the focus was exactly where you intended it to be. But if the subject was a younger child, there may not be time to select the individual focus point, so the Auto Servo AF would be a better option. So when you're doing portrait work for older children and adults, single servo AF combined with single point AF will give you the most accurate results. When you're photographing younger children, you may want to use the auto servo AF combined with the auto area AF to get good focus. The last of the focusing modes is the manual focus or MF mode. This gives you the control to manually focus on any subject through the viewfinder by using the focus ring. Another cause of poor focus is camera shake. This happens when the camera moves while the shutter is open, exposing the image sensor. Always try to steady the camera. Holding it with two hands and pressing the viewfinder gently against your face will help. You can also lean against something or use a tripod, a monopod, or even a bean bag to steady the camera. You can also reduce the effect of camera shake by selecting a fast shutter speed. This reduces the amount of time the image sensor is exposed to shaky conditions. A helpful rule of thumb is to set your shutter speed to one over the focal length. Confusing? Let me explain. If the focal length of your lens is 300 millimeters, for example, you should set your shutter speed to at least 1 300th of a second. If the focal length is 30 millimeters, you might get by by using a shutter speed as low as 1 30th of a second. Another cause of poor focus is digital grain, which is sometimes called noise. You can avoid noise by not enlarging an image too much. If you know you must enlarge an image, select as large a file format as possible. You can also keep out noise by photographing subjects that have good contrast. Finally, to reduce digital noise in your images, you can let your camera cool off for a moment before shooting more pictures after heavy use. An overheated image sensor will add noise to your pictures. Let's take a look at the D5100 sophisticated menu system. To access the menu, simply press the menu button. There are six different menus including the playback, shooting, custom setting, setup, retouch, and recent settings. Many of these settings are discussed in greater detail in other chapters of this guide. We'll just look at an overview of the menu items in this chapter. 
Let's first take a look at each of the items in the playback menu. First, here is the delete option. Here you can choose to delete a selected group of images, deleting images by the date they were taken, or you can delete all of the images. The next playback menu item is the playback folder. Here you can select which folder of images you'd like to be viewed in playback mode. The next option is the playback display options folder. This is where you can choose which playback display options you'd like to be enabled. You can choose to enable or disable the image only option, blinking highlights, RGB histogram, the shooting data, and the overview playback displays. The next option allows you to turn the image review on or off. Here you can choose to have the images that were taken with a vertical orientation automatically rotate for viewing on the playback screen. The next option is the slideshow, where you can create a slideshow of the images for playback on the camera's LCD or television when the camera is properly connected using the provided cable. The DPOF print order option will allow you to choose the order that images are printed directly from the camera when you're using a compatible printer. The next menu is the shooting menu. The first option allows you to reset the shooting menu settings to factory default. The next option allows you to create additional folders for the images to be saved. The next two options are the image quality and size, followed by the white balance option. The white balance option will allow you to choose any of the camera's white balance settings. The next two options are the picture control options. You can choose a picture control here, or you can make adjustments to your custom picture controls. The auto distortion control setting can be turned on or off depending on your personal preference and the lens that you're using. If you're using a wide angle lens, you will probably want to have the auto distortion control option set to on. Next, there is the color space option. Your camera has two color space options. Some photographers prefer the sRGB mode as it requires less processing later. Other photographers prefer the Adobe RGB mode as this mode has a wider range of colors, making it a preferred option for images that would be extensively processed on the computer. The active delighting option is next. Active delighting helps preserve highlight and shadow areas, making images look more natural. Overall, active delighting is a great way to improve your photos in camera. Choose the high or extra high setting for low ISOs and the normal or low settings for higher ISOs. A new feature on the D5100 is the High Dynamic Range, or HDR, option. This menu item will allow you to create amazing HDR images in camera. First, you'll need to make sure that HDR mode is set to on. HDR will then be displayed in the viewfinder. Next, you'll want to set the exposure differential. This setting should be adjusted based on the level of contrast in the scene you're photographing. Scenes with high contrast should use higher values. The last thing you'll need to adjust is the level of smoothing you'd like between the boundaries of the two images that will be taken. After you've made adjustments to these menu settings, simply frame the image and take the picture. The shutter will be released twice to take two exposures to combine to create the final HDR image. The next option in the shooting menu is the long exposure noise reduction option. Here you can choose to have the noise reduction set to on or off for images taken at shutter speeds slower than one second. You can also choose the level of noise reduction you'd like for images taken at high ISO settings. You can choose from high, normal, low, and off. The ISO sensitivity settings will allow you not only to choose the ISO setting, but make adjustments to the range of ISO settings that are available when the camera is set to auto ISO. Here, if you set the ISO sensitivity control to on, you will be able to select the maximum ISO sensitivity and the minimum shutter speed controls. The next option is the release mode settings, where you can choose the camera's release mode. The multiple exposure option will allow you to take creative multiple exposure images. First, you'll need to set the option to on, and then choose whether you'd like to have two or three images used for your multiple exposure. The gain determines how much adjustment to exposure the camera makes for each image. If you want to have the exact same exposure value for each shot, auto gain should be set to on. 
If you're photographing subjects with a dark background or if you want to manually control the exposure for each shot, the offsetting would work well. After you've made these menu selections, simply take the number of shots that you selected and the camera will combine them into a multiple exposure image. The next menu option is the movie settings option where you can choose the movie quality and microphone settings. The final menu option in the shooting menu is the interval timer option. With this feature you can set the camera to take photos at preset time intervals which can be minutes or hours. Photographers use this feature for documentary or scientific work as well as artistic and creative purposes. The interval timer could be used for photographing anything from runners in a race to dramatic sunrise, sunsets, to create self-portraits in studio. You'll probably get the best results using this function if the camera is on a tripod. The next menu is the custom settings menu. Here you can access options for autofocus, exposure, timers, and AE lock, shooting and display, bracketing and flash, and controls. The next menu is the setup menu. The format memory card option is first, followed by the monitor brightness option. Next is the information display format option where you can choose to have the information display shown in the default, graphic format, or the classic format. Next is the auto information display option where you can choose whether you want the information display to appear automatically after a photo is taken. The clean image sensor option allows you to choose at what times you'd like the image sensor to be cleaned. The lock mirror up for cleaning option will lock the camera's mirror up so the sensor can be cleaned manually. Here you can choose the video mode, NTSC or PAL. If you're in the United States, you'll want to select NTSC. The HDMI option is where you can choose the resolution to be used when your camera is connected to an HD television and the device control option will allow you to have a compatible television's remote control the camera. The flicker reduction is used when you're using the live view or movie mode under fluorescent or mercury vapor lights. You'll want the setting to match the local AC power supply. The next options allow you to set the time and date and language for the menu system and displays. Here you can enter an image comment and this option allows you to have images auto-rotate. The image dust off reference photo option is used in conjunction with the Nikon Capture NX2 software to automatically remove image sensor dust spots from images. The next option is used with the optional Nikon GPS unit and the final option in the setup menu is the firmware version where you can see which firmware version is currently installed. The next menu is the retouch menu. Each of these menu items are discussed in detail in Chapter 5. The final menu is the Recent Settings menu. Here you can quickly access any of the menu settings that you have recently used. Let's discuss white balance. It's important to understand that the quality of your pictures is affected by the color of the surrounding light and how the camera's electronics process that light. Compensating for varying light conditions is referred to as setting the white balance. Most light looks white to an untrained eye, but it can be composed of a range of different colors. The color of sunlight is different in daylight, in the shade, or in cloudy conditions. Daylight, for example, is fairly blue, and fluorescent light is fairly green. If your camera is set to shoot in daylight, but you're shooting in a setting with fluorescent light, your image will look overly red. Proper camera white balance takes into account the color temperature of a light source, which refers to the relative warmth or coolness of white light. Human eyes are very good at judging what is white under different light sources. However, digital cameras often have great difficulty determining auto white balance, or AWB. Incorrect white balance can create unattractive blue, orange, or even green colors in your photos. The white balance scale is expressed in measurements of Kelvin. The higher color temperatures measured in the area of 5600 Kelvin to 7500 Kelvin represent situations like a sunlit or cloudy day. These shooting situations have a greater amount of blue tones and a lesser amount of red tones. Lower color temperature situations are measured in the areas of 3200 Kelvin down to 1900 Kelvin and are found in lighting situations like standard lighting from a tungsten light bulb or candlelight. 
These types of shooting situations are found on the lower end of the spectrum and produce greater amounts of red tones and lesser amounts of blue tones. Once you get acquainted with the camera's preset white balance settings, you can try setting your own by using the camera's custom white balance feature. To use this tool effectively, you'll want to be familiar with the color temperature that is most effective for your shooting situation. Again, most light looks white to an untrained eye. Setting your white balance will help your pictures have the proper coloring. If natural looking colors cannot be obtained with auto white balance, you can set the white balance manually to suit the respective light source. In the basic zone modes, the white balance will be set automatically. To access the white balance settings, press the Information Edit button to place the cursor in the information display and navigate to the white balance settings. Here you can choose from each of the camera's white balance options. Your camera will attempt to automatically determine the white balance when it is set to the auto white balance mode. This is the default setting, but you can get better results by setting a preset white balance or by manually customizing the white balance. The next white balance setting is daylight. Daylight is a great setting for taking pictures in the sunlight. This setting is marked with the sun icon. Use the shade setting when you're taking pictures in the shade. It reduces the bluish tones in a picture. This setting is marked by an icon of a house with shade. Use the cloudy setting when taking pictures on days that are overcast. This is marked with a cloud icon. The tungsten light setting is used when taking pictures under common light bulbs. It reduces the reddish tones in a picture. This setting is marked with a light bulb icon. The fluorescent light setting is great for taking pictures under fluorescent lighting. With the D5100, you can choose one of seven different fluorescent white balance options, depending on the type of fluorescent light you're shooting under. The different fluorescent white balance options are accessed in the camera's menu system. The next setting is the flash setting. Use this setting when using the built-in or an external flash unit. The last icon is the preset manual or custom white balance option. Use this setting when you want to manually set the white balance for a specific light source for better accuracy. This is done by taking a picture of a white card or object and then selecting the image for the camera's electronics to reference. An 18% gray card, which can be purchased at your local camera store, will give you the most accurate results. You can also use a white card, an object like a shirt, or a piece of paper to achieve similar results. Place the gray or white object in the lighting conditions you will be shooting in. Press the menu button. Highlight white balance in the shooting menu. Press the right multi-selector button to display options. Highlight preset manual and press the right arrow again. Select measure and press the right arrow again. Highlight yes and press OK. The camera will then instruct you to take a picture of the white or gray paper or cloth. When the camera is ready to measure the white balance, PRE will flash. Now fill the viewfinder with the white or gray object and take the picture. You may need to switch the lens to manual focus. If the white balance measurement was successful, GD will flash in the viewfinder. Otherwise, a flashing no GD will appear and you'll need to take the picture again. In addition to white balance, there are two other features on the D5100 that can improve the quality of your images, picture controls and active D lighting. Let's talk about the picture controls. This feature will allow you to customize the look of your image. There are six picture controls, including standard, neutral, vivid, monochrome, portrait, and landscape. To view and select the picture controls, first make sure that your camera is set to PSA or M shooting mode. Then press the information edit button to place the cursor in the display. Use the multi-selector to scroll to the picture control setting and press OK. From this menu, you can choose the picture control you'd like to use. The standard picture control is the default setting and it offers standard processing and balanced results. This is a good picture control for general situations. The neutral picture control is a good setting to choose if you wish to process your images with your computer. Colors in this picture style are neutral and subdued. The vivid picture control is great for images with primary colors that you'd like emphasized. The monochrome picture control is useful when you would like to take black and white photographs. Note, images taken in this setting cannot be converted to color later. 
The portrait picture control is great for portraits. It offers pleasant skin tones and textures. The landscape picture control is good for taking pictures of scenery or cities outdoors. Let's modify a picture control. First, we'll select a picture control to modify. We'll choose Vivid. To adjust the settings, we can use the arrows on the multi-selector. To make the color on the Vivid picture control a little less saturated, select Saturation and use the multi-selector to choose a value toward the minus side of the scale. Press OK to save changes. Picture controls that have been modified are shown with an asterisk on the picture control menu. The D5100 has a feature called Active D-Lighting. When enabled, this feature will preserve detail in images with high contrast. This feature is most effective when it's used with matrix metering mode. To use Active D-Lighting, make sure that your camera is set to PSA or M mode and press the Information Edit button. Scroll to the Active D-Lighting option and press OK. If Auto is selected, the camera will automatically adjust Active D-Lighting according to shooting conditions. Extra High and High will preserve the most amount of detail in highlight and shadow areas, and Normal and Low will preserve less detail. Let's talk a little about choosing the right lens for your photography. Lenses are available in a wide range of focal lengths, each with its own benefits and uses. The focal length on a lens is the first series of numbers on a lens barrel, and it's measured in millimeters. This lens, for instance, is an 18 to 55 millimeter lens, or the focal length range is from 18 millimeters to 55 millimeters. Lenses that have a range of focal lengths like this, 18 to 55 millimeter, are zoom lenses. Zoom lenses have the ability to get closer or farther away from the subject without ever actually moving the camera. Lenses that have only one focal length are prime lenses. Prime lenses do not have zooming capability, but many professional photographers prefer them, particularly for portraits because of the great clarity they offer. With this understanding of focal lengths and millimeters, we can discuss some of the different ranges of focal lengths as well as the lens categories that different focal lengths fall into. Lenses that are less than 50 millimeters are considered to be wide angle lenses. So the 18 to 55 that we talked about could fall into the wide angle range because it goes down to 18 millimeters. Wide angle lenses are great for landscape shots as well as situations where space is limited and you want to include as much of a scene as possible. Mid-range lenses have between 50 and 85 millimeters. This range of focal lengths is great for family snapshots, portraits, and vacations. The 18 to 55 lens that came with your camera also falls into the mid-range category. These lenses are often referred to as walk-around lenses because they are so versatile and can be used for a variety of subjects and shooting scenarios. Telephoto lenses are lenses with over 85 millimeters and are great for getting closer to your subject. Sports and wildlife photographers use telephoto lenses extensively to zoom in on the subject. Telephoto lenses are also great for getting amazing close-up shots of flowers or other small objects. In addition to apertures and focal lengths, there is one more important feature that you should consider when you're shopping for a Nikon lens, vibration reduction. Vibration reduction will help you get sharp photos at slower shutter speeds. This feature is especially useful in low light conditions and can make the difference between a photo like this and a photo like this. The vibration reduction feature is not available for all lenses and is activated with a small switch on the lens barrel normally located near the autofocus manual focus switch. Your D5100 has a powerful built-in flash that can provide you with extra light in certain shooting scenarios. The effective range of the built-in flash is between 2 and 30 feet, depending on the aperture, shutter speed, and ISO. As a general rule, you'll want to keep your subject within about 3.5 to 20 feet for the best results. To use the built-in flash in the P, S, A, and M mode, simply press the flash button and the flash will pop up. In the automatic and scene modes, the built-in flash will pop up and fire automatically in low light or backlight conditions. In flash off mode, landscape mode, and sports mode, the flash will not fire. The built-in flash has five different flash modes to choose from. 
To access the camera's built-in flash modes, press the Information Edit button to place the cursor in the display and select the Flash Mode option. Here you can use the multi-selector to choose the desired flash mode. The first flash mode is automatic. This mode is a good general use flash mode. This mode is available only in the automatic and scene modes. The camera will calculate how much light is needed and the flash will provide that light. The next flash mode is red eye reduction. This mode is good to use when you're photographing people or pets. In this mode, a tiny pre-flash will fire, causing the size of the person's pupils to shrink, lessening the effect of red eye in the photo. The next flash mode is slow sync mode, which is available only in the PSA and M modes. This flash mode is a good mode to use when you're photographing a subject at night and you would like to have the background and the subject properly exposed. The last flash mode is Rear Curtain Sync, also available only in the P, S, A, and M modes. In this mode, the flash fires just before the shutter closes, which will create a stream of light behind light sources. The subject will be properly exposed. To review, let's go through some examples of these situations to manually apply the principles learned in this guide. First, let's approach a portrait situation. It is always smart to first preset the white balance to match the current lighting. Use the preset or custom white balance. To make the subject the focal point, position the subject in the frame in a way that will draw more attention to the subject. You can achieve this by using the rule of thirds. Make sure the focus point is correct. Another great way to give focus to the subject is by blurring the background. This effect is achieved by opening the aperture. Remember, the smaller the F number, the larger the aperture opening. After the aperture is set, adjust the shutter speed to achieve a proper exposure. By opening the aperture more, you create a shallow depth of field. This will allow your focus point to be in sharp focus, while the background will have a soft focus. The next common situation is a landscape you will usually want the whole landscape to be in sharp focus. To achieve this, the aperture will need to be set for a very narrow opening. Remember, the larger the F number, the smaller the depth of field. A small opening creates a very long depth of field. This mode will give you a sharp focus in both the foreground and the background. Then adjust the shutter speed to achieve a proper exposure. In this setting, the shutter speed can get pretty slow, so be sure to steady your camera or use a tripod to avoid camera shake. When taking pictures at sporting events or shooting subjects with a lot of motion, it's a good idea to prepare your camera before the action begins. Here are some tips to help you prepare. First, preset your white balance. Next, set the focus mode to continuous so that the camera will be constantly focusing on the moving subject. Now set your release or drive mode to continuous so when the action happens, you only need to hold down the button. Now position yourself to have the best angle for the action. If you want your subject to be in sharp focus, turn your ISO up around 400 to 1600. Next, adjust your shutter speed to 1 500th of a second or faster, and then adjust your aperture for a proper exposure. Take a couple of practice shots to fine tune. Now you're ready for action. If you want to show a little blur to add aesthetic effect, slightly slow the shutter speed. We hope you've enjoyed learning more about your Nikon D5100. We know this new information will give you enough confidence and know-how to take your photography skills to new levels. Remember, you can refer back to any section of this guide at any time. Just select the topics you want to review from the main menu or table of contents. Watch for more Quick Pro guides on newly released cameras. Thanks for watching.